With its beginning in 1988, Oski has quickly established itself as one of the richest and best credentialed water skiing tournaments in the world. Although it has attracted the best in the sport, this year's an exception. The field is the greatest yet. Initially a jumps event, Oski has lengthened its number of events to include barefoot drags, jet boat precision driving, the Sea World show team, trick skiing demonstrations and the slalom and jump contests. Dina Mapple returns to Raymond Terrace after winning the women's jump in 88. Currently ranked number one in the world and the world record holder for the jump, Mapple is the logical choice to start favourite. She will be pushed by American Lisa Simino, who is on her third visit and she's improving each year. But the girls from the United States will strike tough opposition from Australia's top female skier, Karen Neville, who is the defending champion. Neville likes the course and is set to turn the tables on her more illustrious opposition. The men's field is a who's who of world skiing. Heading the list is four times world overall champion Sammy Giovelli for the United States, who is the current number one ranked jumper and the holder of the world record and an amazing 67.7 metres. Making his first appearance is world slalom champion Andy Mapple, and it will be worth being at Raymond Terrace just to watch this brilliant skier. Again, the Aussies will be among the leaders, with 1988 champion Jeff Carrington in red-hot form on the world tour this year, and defending men's champion Bruce Neville will be keen to retain his title he won in fine style last year. The freestyle event should be a showdown between Dave Reinhardt of the United States and former world barefoot champion Aussie Brett Wing. In all, the event has attracted the hottest jumps field ever and with the improved facilities will provide a great spectacle for sports lovers of the hunter. Tenancy Commissioner Bob Brown plans to talk to the owners of mobile homes and park proprietors after numerous complaints were outlined on MBN News last night. His aim is to draft a code of practice acceptable to both sides. Yesterday, members of the newly formed Mobile Home and Park Residents Association spoke of their fears. I'm worried sick about that type of thing, yes. All I want to do is sell my home and get out of the park. I never dreamt I've done a lot of things wrong in my life, but this is the worst thing I've ever done. As far as I'm concerned, you go into a park and unfortunately use your light as the, uh, rights as a citizen. And to me, you're losing all rights as in your dignity as a human being. They wish to see various loopholes covered. These include being given park rules before they take up residence, controlled rent rises, reasonable visitors' fees and right of sale of their mobile homes. Warwick John Baxter of Madawi died before he could be freed from the wreck of his family's van which slammed into the side of a stationary rail car at about 8 o'clock last night. The Datsun van had just turned into Cormorant Drive when, according to the police, the driver, the boy's father, lost control. Warwick was in the front seat. Another passenger, a 10-year-old girl, was taken to the Mata Hospital. The Police Accident Investigation Unit was called in. After lengthy questioning, the boy's father has been charged with culpable driving and drive in a manner dangerous. The Seagulls and the Knights both entered the Winterfield Cup competition in 1988. Since then they have clashed several times, with the Knights often the victor. But club rivalry gave way to genuine concern when the Seagulls club handed over a cheque for $78,000 for the Lord Mayor's Earthquake Relief Fund. We've always be, been uh, very interested in uh, Newcastle as a town that has a good background in rugby league and uh, the grit and, uh, they have showed over the years in, against international sides I think enthused a lot of the, uh, our board and, uh, uh, but, but the devastation that, was, uh, that came out of Newcastle I think would make anyone uh, enthusiastic to help. Alderman McNaughton said he appreciated not only the monetary donation but also the spirit in which it was given. 
It's much more than, than the money. The money is essential. We can't do anything without it. But the lift in our spirits, knowing that people all over Australia are donating money to this very important fund, is, gives a lift to the whole of our community. I'm sure that exists. And uh, this one from the seagulls at Tweed Heads is just another example of that. And we're very grateful to them for what they've done. Yeah. Tony Hopping from Sydney will face his strongest challenge so far this season as he attempts to hang on to his champion's crown. 45 drivers from all over the state and some from interstate are here to try and wrest the title from Hopping. Another championship up for grabs tomorrow night is the New South Wales Formula 500 title and 41 drivers from five states will take part. Roy Urpeth will be hard to beat with South Australian Ken Bowie likely to be the toughest competition. Another sport hoping for fine weather will be Rugby League as the Newcastle Knights take on St George at Murray Breen over Wyong tomorrow night. The Knights have made a couple of changes. David Boyd returns from injury, Tony Kemp comes into the centres and youngster Paul Harrigan moves up to the front row. The Dragons and the Knights met under lights last year with the Red and Whites victorious but it's a chance for both coaches Craig Young and Alan McMahon to have a look at some players' ability before the season proper. For captain Sam Stewart, it's a match that must be taken seriously. We've named our top 13 take the field and uh, we're going out there to win the game first of all and to sort of win sort of different aspects of the game as well as get a lot of our sort of parts of the game correct that we've so probably lapped against uh, North last weekend and that's probably the defence. We feel that we can probably tighten our defence up and improve our defence as well as our, our ruck plays. So uh, we're taking it very seriously and uh, you know we're putting our best foot forward and hopefully we're going to win it. Settlers Cove from uh, Sydney, trained by Jack Denham's, won its last two in Sydney and is unbeaten and is probably one of the best two-year-olds in Sydney going round. He, uh, at his last start, beat Whisk, one of Neville Beggs, a great supporter of Newcastle and uh, just beat him and uh, he's also an acceptor. And uh, we've got a couple of local hopes, uh, one of Johnny Deemer's uh, fashion opera, he's got a big boom on it, John, and uh, also Johnny Bloomer's got one called Pipaway. The new market field is really a top quality field. Uh, we've got our Poverty Bay, a last start winner, and uh, he's a real boom horse in Sydney at present. Uh, Sid Brown trains him. Uh, also, uh, our local, uh, our normal supporters, Tommy Smith, My Mayfield Smith, they've all supported us very well. Mighty Gray from, from Brisbane has come down. He's won uh, oh, quite a deal of prize money, over $150,000 worth of prize money, and it's a real quality field. We're thrilled with it. Thirty-two boats from all states will battle it out over the next two days to see who will be crowned the Aussie champ. Today, 26 races were conducted in winds that varied quite a bit, but it didn't perturb the best 16-foot sailors in the land. Two of the hot shots raced early with mixed success. Stephen Norbus sailing GIO is one of the fancied competitors, but today he was soundly trounced by local boat MJH, skippered by Alan Cummings. MJH was in brilliant form in the first heat and easily led his three rivals at all marks. Craig Nichols and Clearview also sailed well in this heat to grab second place. GIO was runner-up in the Australian Championships and will have to improve dramatically to go further in the event. But the man they all must catch is the current Australian and New South Wales champion Dennis Tanko. Sailing Otis, Tanko was superb in his first heat, although it nearly all came to grief on the wing mark. Otis was in front but Loctite was making a determined bid to get on level terms. Both boats came together momentarily but no harm was done to boats or crews. Tanko guided Otis to the line for a narrow win over Loctite. Racing continues tomorrow with the final at around 4 o'clock. Competitors from the 12 clubs comprising the Newcastle District Surf Lifesaving Movement had their last hit out before the New South Wales State title was at Swansea Belmont next weekend. And it was that club who dominated today's carnival. Drew Blatchford won the junior Ironman and as expected Guy Andrews won the seniors. 
The open ski race was a beauty. With waves making it a little tricky to get out and back, there wasn't much distance between first and last for much of the race. On the paddle back to shore, it was a battle between Fillmore and Greg Kelly, both of Swansea Belmont. There was nothing in it as they neared the line, but the judge's decision went to Moore. In the under-15 girls' beat sprint, the name of Doust again was to the fore. Fingal Bay's Alyssa Doust, younger sister of champion Penny, blitzed her rivals to win in smart time from Simone Vandenberg and Amy Peacock. Todd Russell from Cooks Hill streeted his rivals to win the under-15 Malibu title, an event he has made his own in the past few carnivals. Melissa Thurlow strengthened her growing reputation with a great swim in the Open Women's Swim, and the Swansea Belmont Club dominated the Open Belt Race, filling all four places. And so they should have. They fielded the four entrants. Sean Davis and Nick Tonhunter were neck and neck for most of the swim, with Davis finally getting up by about eight or nine strokes. The Newcastle branch will perform well at next week's state championships. Workmen were frantically putting things in place for the running of the $150,000 Penfolds Classic tomorrow and the $150,000 Foster's Newmarket Handicap on Wednesday. The track itself was saturated with over 675 millimetres of rain in the recent big wet and it's a credit to its drying capacity and the ground staff that it will be good to fast. The Beaufort Club held their annual pre-carnival luncheon at the race course today with guest speaker Craig Johnson eager for a tip or two. The Penfolds Classic has always been a good pointer to Sydney's Golden Slipper and tomorrow's race should provide an insight as to the quality of New South Wales' top two-year-olds. Gary Harley feels that the race will be fought out between Whist and Settlers Cove. The Neville Begg train Whist was runner-up to Settlers Cove on February the 10th but should turn the tables tomorrow. The rescue plan was that Westpac owned the vessel but under the control of the Newcastle Maritime Museum. Now this has been rejected, the vessel may have to be sold. A likely buyer is a Sydney tourist boat operator. The buyer and the amount haven't been disclosed, but I would imagine that it would be not very much more than covering the debt to Westpac. The replacement value of William IV is something like $1.7 million, as was the building cost. So it seems quite bad that it should be sold for something in the order of 300000 This follows exhaustive attempts to solve the ship's debts of around $400,000. The project was launched in 1984 with grants from the Bicentennial Authority and the Steel Regions Assistance Program. Further requests to them for money have been rejected. The New South Wales and federal governments and local councils have also been unable to help. A request for corporate sponsorship has also been unsuccessful. The bank loan was secured to finish off the boat before Australia Day 1988. According to its captain, without this loan, the vessel could have kept its head above water. It was just unfortunate that a group of people, albeit a small group, decided to borrow 300000 right at the last moment to make a dash for Sydney for the bicentenary celebrations. Had William IV been completed at a leisurely pace, there'd be no debt. Meanwhile, hundreds of people had sunk both time and money into the venture. It was originally envisaged that the boat would be moored in Newcastle and groups would pay to look aboard, but even during the bicentennial year, sufficient interest was just not there. Because of its authentic design, the vessel is labour-intensive, needing specially trained crew. But even so, with volunteers manning the William IV for harbour cruises, it can make up to $40,000 a year. And even at this 11th hour, ship's patron, Peter Morris, Minister for Industrial Relations, believes it can be saved. We have not been able to mount a public appeal as we had intended because of the earthquake. 
but as soon as the opportunity is there, we want to get together, get things underway, and I still firmly believe that, given the opportunity, we can raise the money that's needed to ensure the vessel remains here. The storm front swept through the city from the south during the two hours between 5 and 7 last night. Scenes like these were common as people drove home from work, with King Street, Parkway Avenue and Cram Street blocked during the downpour. Water lapped the front door of homes and the fire brigade was called to pump out several houses. Most flood damage to buildings occurred in Merriweather and Belmont North. Power line damage was reported from Katara, Wharf Road and Merriweather and many parts of Newcastle and Lake Macquarie experienced intermittent power blackouts. All power has now been restored. Most of the flood trouble spots have cleared and emergency services have been at work in several parts of the city where winds caused further damage to earthquake affected buildings. In Adamstown Heights, a home narrowly escaped major damage when a tree loosened in last night's rain blew over this morning. The port of Newcastle has been closed to shipping with high seas and winds gusting up to 50 kilometres per hour. At the moment, around 80 children with cancer have initial treatment at Sydney's Prince of Wales Hospital. NBN-run telethons from 1983 have provided up to $5.5 million for oncology equipment in the Hunter. This has enabled children to continue their treatment in both chemotherapy and radiology in the area. At present, they receive treatment in the paediatric ward of the Mater Hospital. Research shows that is preferable to being mixed with adult patients. But with the imminent opening of the Mater's Level 3 oncology wing, special arrangements are being made. Within four to six weeks, I'm assured by the hospital, there will become an area available for treatment which will have a time slot book for it for children only. And with the opening of John Hunter Hospital, paediatric oncology services will be relocated there. Because there's a new unit being developed at John Hunter Hospital, the best way to use those funds at the present moment was to provide support facilities such as the CAT scanner, which means that children don't have to go over to Royal Newcastle Hospital or to Sydney to get that very important diagnostic test. It's been used to give, to purchase for them such things as um, uh, pumps or things that will enable them to be able to go into the community, get home and be supported at home. We also use the villa units where children and their parents can stay while they're receiving treatment here. Dr Lang says funds have not been spent on remodelling the paediatric ward because this would only be a temporary placement of services. Though vital equipment like a CAT scan and linear accelerator have made cancer treatment accessible locally, physical lack of space has been a problem. The chemotherapy treatment room for adults can accommodate a maximum of only five patients. A similar treatment room for children in the paediatric ward can treat only one. Some children have to spend up to 10 hours in the hospital during tests and treatment. The hospital says this is unavoidable, though it's admitted that further delays caused by a shortage of funds has caused an extra burden on young patients. If, however, you don't have sufficient registrars, it's true that if a registrar is tied up in casualty with a very sick child, then he takes a while to get back to put up the drip and look after that child. So there is those sorts of delays, and there's no doubt that if we did have... Um, more funds in this region for that kind of senior registrar staff, then that 
that delay might be um, avoided. And because paediatric oncology is such a specialised area, the hunter's population of half a million will never justify an independent centre of expertise, according to Dr James. We have 10 to 12 children a year and we should be able to look after the majority of them, but there will be just those occasional patients in the paediatric oncology service that will need the services of Prince of Wales that look after, say, 100 a year. The state government-backed inquiry is taking evidence from the industry heads in an effort to hear the latest developments in alternative fuels and ways of conserving energy. The six-member parliamentary panel will also take evidence in Sydney, Penrith and Queanbeyan before handing down its findings. Newcastle City Hall was the venue for the inquiry and less than 10 industry heads gathered to give evidence. Michael Slater, representing Shortland County Council, told the inquiry his department is now testing new brands of light globes that give off a brighter light at lower electricity levels, with the view to selling the bulbs to the public. Members of the panel then criticised the council for retaining high energy appliances in their showrooms and not offering solely low energy using goods. Well, I think... Uh, I think uh there's a, a commercial problem that uh, county councils uh, are looking at and I think Shortland's one of those. However, there was some good news to come out of the inquiry. The state government has approved an electricity technology centre for Newcastle. The centre will become the area's showpiece for the latest developments in the electrical goods industry. The inquiry will now move to Sydney, Penrith and Queanbeyan before tabling their report in May. Representatives from the four countries participating in the celebrations were led into Cessnock Town Hall to the swell of bagpipes and clapping. Veterans from the Rothby Riot in 1929, wives and present day miners rose to their feet to greet the unionists. Mayor Marie Callaghan in her welcoming speech said that New South Wales and Australia in general owe a great deal to the mining industry. The country's 35,000 miners consistently help our balance of trade figures through their extraction of the black gold. The miners' chests swelled even further when Mayor Callaghan told the gathering that Cessnock was put on the map and is known nationally for its mining. The celebrations continue tomorrow with a morning street parade and a Freedom of the City declaration. Darren Curtis for NBN News.